Good morning. Welcome to uh, Academic Freedom, the Global Challenge. I'm Mike Lignatieff, the President and Rector of Central European University. Um, it's wonderful to see you here early on a Thursday morning. I want to send welcomes and greetings to uh, it's a powerful room. We've got many of our trustees, um, the people who actually are accountable for this institution are in the room, and I thank the trustees for coming a day early to be with us. Uh, I want to thank so many of the faculty, so many of the staff, some great students, some alumni uh, for being here, and we're on live feed. Uh, so we're beaming out to our alumni networks and our friends around the world, and I bid everybody on live feed the warmest possible uh, welcome. And uh, I want to welcome also the journalists who are covering this event today, so that's a polite way of saying we've got to be on our best behavior the whole day. Um, our, our day is going to begin very shortly with a lecture by a great historian, a wise woman, uh, um, a woman I've admired all my life as a historian. She's come a long way to be with us, and uh, it will be a delight to hear her shortly, uh, in part because her writing on academic freedom has been pungent and clear and crisp and has led the debate for many years. So the day will begin with a bang, and it'll end with a bang, uh, because we will end the event uh, with a lecture by one of the world's greatest writers and one of the great champions of freedom, Mar Mario Vargas Llosa. In between, just as important, we're going to hold panel discussions on the state of academic freedom in Hungary. We're going to look at the challenges to academic freedom from within the academy the fierce, often ferocious, sometimes even violent debates about academic freedom, particularly on American campuses. And then we want to widen out and make sure that we talk <coughs> about the challenges to academic freedom uh, uh, around the world. Uh, so we've got a very ambitious agenda. I hope those of you who are here now will be here right through until 6 o'clock when we'll have a reception next door. Um, I need to thank a few people without whom this would not have happened. Uh, Kinga Pal, the irreplaceable Kinga Pal, Stefan Rock, Livio Mate, uh, the provost and the Iron Man of CEU. Uh, <laughs> Matias Sabo, who played a particularly <coughs> important role. Um, and I also want to thank, if I may, my wife for pointing out this wonderful picture. Um, it, she, she saw this picture and it points University Square one way and Freedom Square the other. In Hungary. It's, an actual, uh, it's an actual place in Budapest. And uh, I think we all want University Square and Freedom Square to point in the same direction. And that is the goal of our activities today. Let me just say a few further words of introduction before we hear from uh, Joan Scott. Um, we're hosting this conference for a perfectly obvious reason, which is that our own academic freedom has been challenged, and the challenge is not over. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, whatever our differences and disagreements, hopes, and no one more fervently than I, that the negotiations that are due to begin tomorrow in New York between the government of Hungary and the governor of New York, where we are accredited, will result in a rapid and conclusive settlement that allows us to say, stay in the city that we love. So our task here today is not another rally, another campaigning event. It's a serious academic event. Um, not merely to defend our freedom, but to do what universities always have to do, which is to interrogate our freedom. That is, to think about its history, 
to ask political questions about the degree to which our freedom still commands support from our fellow citizens. And above all, to learn from other institutions and other countries where academic freedom is under attack. It's actually a day for CU, how can I put this, to say we're not so special. We're not so unique. There are a lot of other places, a lot of other institutions, a lot of other countries. Think Turkey, just to pick one example, where academic freedom is on the line. Let's also recall that even in Hungary, we're not so special and so unique. We pride ourselves in being part and parcel of academic life in Hungary, and Hungarian academic institutions have been under increasing pressures of all kinds. And so one of the most important panels today will be a discussion with our Hungarian colleagues about the challenges we face. The panel is, in a way, our way of saying thank you to our Hungarian colleagues and friends for the support they've given us and say, we're not so special, we want to join in a discussion that ends up strengthening Hungarian institutions uh, right across the country. Because to repeat an obvious point, this is a country with an extraordinarily great, distinguished academic reputation, uh, and we're proud to be part of it, and we want to do anything we can to strengthen it. We also want to make the point that the challenges to academic freedom are global, and then we want to ask if you widen our frame out beyond Eastern Europe and Central Europe, and we see the battle for academic freedom as we should as a battle being fought in Africa and Asia, in North and South America as well, what do we learn? Why is it that universities are under attack in so many places, and what can we do about it? How do we deepen support for academic freedom so that when academics and professors and students fight for their freedom, our fellow citizens respond and say, you're fighting for us too. The politics of this, it seems to me, are crucial. We also want to look at the challenges coming from within. And these are red hot controversial. There's nothing about academic freedom that is safe terrain. For some in the academy, uh, the university must be a free space for every opinion, including hateful ones. On the other hand, there are others who feel equally passionately that the academy must refuse to lend its authority to ideas that question commitments to dignity, rights, and freedom. For some colleagues, there should be no safe spaces, no taboos, no trigger warnings to protect students from unwelcome ideas. And for other people, that idea of freedom just seems brutal. It seems to ignore the deep, enduring psychological harm that ideas can do. We're not going to resolve those conflicts today, but we need to understand just how controversial, just how contested the idea of academic freedom is from within. And if we're going to defend academic freedom, then we need to defend the debate about academic freedom and pursue it without fear or favor. Finally, and this really connects, I guess, to uh, the lecture that we will have from Maria Vargas Llosa, one purpose of the conference is to connect the idea of academic freedom to democracy itself. This may seem obvious, but for many of our fellow citizens, academic freedom is sometimes regarded simply as the privilege of a professional caste, the professoriate. And that's done us harm. It's isolated us from the citizens that universities must always serve. And if academic freedom simply becomes reduced to the defense of a privileges of a professional caste, we will not have friends and the friends we need when the wolves start to prowl around our doors. We need to remind ourselves that <laughs> A society that has elections but doesn't have free institutions is actually not a free society. A society that does not foster places where ideas, including dangerous ones, are free to roam will not be free for long. And we hope, whatever else we accomplish, that the day will renew our faith as a group, whatever our political differences, in the vital connection between academic freedom and democratic life itself. 
To take us right into the thick of these questions, we need, as I said earlier, a wise woman, a trusted guide, an eminent scholar, a critical friend of academic freedom whose writing on the subject has helped shape the debate for more than 20 years. And we're very, very lucky indeed to begin today with a lecture by Joan Scott. She's a professor emerita of history at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. She's a famous historian of France. Her works are assigned, I know, in, in uh, CU. She's taught at CU. She's a friend of CU. She's a great historian of the French Revolution and a great historian of the idea of human rights. The title of her talk is Academic Freedom, the University and the State. Please welcome Joan Scott. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, um, to be part of this ongoing conversation about academic freedom. And I want to particularly thank Michael Ignatieff, not only for inviting me, but for leading a fight these last months that has inspired many of us um, all over the world. Uh, as he said, what's going on at CEU is not unique to CEU but the example that he's offered us in, in the eloquent defense of academic freedom that he's produced has been a really important and inspiring one. So thank you, Michael. So I'm gonna talk about academic freedom. Um, academic freedom is highly specific to institutions of scholarly research and teaching. It's not like liberty or equality, a universal human right. It's not a general right of free speech although the two are often confused. Instead, academic freedom, academic freedom applies to those of us who are associated with universities. It refers both to the internal functions of the university, to the research and teaching that go on here, and to the external relations of the university with the nation state. And it's the question of the relationship between the university and the state that I want to address today. The relationship is not a simple one, it's traversed by tensions that are necessary and unresolvable. And I want to look at two of those tensions. The first is between the search for truth and the demands of power, what might be called a tension between raison and raison d'etat. The second tension is between the hierarchical structure of the academy and the principles and practices of political democracies. I want to argue that academic freedom mediates both of those tensions. So first, the university and the nation. The origin of the modern university has everything to do with nation building. An older history is that of the religious sponsorship of universities with the various relations between churches and states affecting their governance. Medieval universities were established to train priests, lawyers, doctors, and schoolmasters, not always with state sanction. But it was Wilhelm von Humboldt who provided the model for the modern university at the University of Berlin early in the 19th century. One scholar has described its function this way. The Humboldtian University, he writes, is the institution charged with watching over the spiritual life of the people of the rational state, reconciling ethnic, tra ethic, ethnic tradition and statist rationality. In Humboldt's vision, shared by many of his German idealist colleagues, the university's mission was to produce students committed to discovery and to inculcate the common language, history, literature, and geography that made possible the creation of a shared national culture. This unifying culture served not only a domestic function, but became an important arm of international competition and imperial expansion. From the late 18th century on, there's been a tension between two avowed purposes of the university, to educate the citizens of the nation state, and equally importantly, to encourage the critical thinking that would correct abuses of power and furnish the nation with the creativity and change that were vital to national well-being. Unfettered rational inquiry was taken to be the best guarantee of a healthy national future. This was Immanuel Kant's argument in the conflict of the faculties that he wrote in 1794. There, Kant insisted that the faculty of philosophy, the so-called lower faculty, was the most vital arm of the university because its job was to interrogate the very foundations of the higher faculties of theology, medicine, and law. Philosophy's interrogation was a correction, not only to stale disciplinary orthodoxy, 
but also to the dangers of unfettered state power and its influence on the more practical disciplines. Kant's essay captures the dilemma that faced the modern university, how to reconcile reason and the state, the search for truth, and the requirements of power. The literary scholar Maso Miyoshi described this dilemma as a tension between what he called utilitarian nationalism, whose aim was to secure the national good, and anti-utilitarian inquiry, which depends on free and spontaneous expression. Quote, the university as an institution has served Caesar and Mammon, he wrote, all the while manifesting its fealty to Minerva, Clio, and the Muses. This tension at the heart of the university's mission has been apparent throughout its history, although changes in demography and curriculum in the nations of the West have sometimes made it less apparent. Neoliberal transformations have certainly taken attention away from both national agendas and critical thinking. Students are now more likely to be treated as paying clients whose human capital can be enhanced by a university education and whose vocational interests should dictate the curriculum. The research and development needs of private companies more often drive the inquiries of professors, especially in the sciences. And globalization, not national interest, is at the heart of what some have termed the information and knowledge industry. Still, I would argue that the Humboldt model has not entirely disappeared. Its tensions remain as a legacy to be drawn on. And it's that legacy that I think it's important for us to think about preserving. Those tensions have been clearly evident in the post-colonial era as new nations emerged to claim identities either denied or suppressed by imperial rule. Edward Said wrote compellingly of this process in a 1996 article on identity, authority, and freedom. There he pointed out, referring to developments in the Middle East, that, quote, Arab universities are not only nationalist universities, but are also political institutions for perfectly understandable reasons. Understandable because all societies accord a remarkable privilege to the university and school as crucibles for shaping national identity. Once national independence had freed these nations from the yokes of Ottoman or European imperialism, he noted, an opportunity opened to educate young people to develop their pride in the traditions, languages, history, and culture of their own countries. The same might be said of the nations of Eastern and Central Europe after the end of Soviet rule in 1989. But a terrible problem soon arose, Said noted, when national universities were reconceived as extensions of the newly established national security state. As a result, the real value of education was short-circuited by a ruling party which sought political conformity rather than intellectual excellence. Quote, nationalism in the university has come to represent not freedom but accommodation, not brilliance and daring but caution and fear, not the advancement of knowledge but self-preservation. Political repression, he went on, has never been good for academic freedom, and perhaps more importantly, it has been disastrous for academic and intellectual excellence. The two, academic freedom and intellectual excellence, are of course entirely interdependent. Without wanting to deny the importance of education for the construction of national identity, Said then asked, what national identity? Which national identity? And how might it be understood in relation to academic freedom? His answer, which I will quote at length because I can't match its clarity and eloquence, acknowledges the needs of the nation but makes critical intellectual work its own raison d'etre. And this is the quote, my assessment of Arab academic life is that too high a price has been paid in sustaining nationalist regimes that have allowed political passions and an ideology of conformity to dominate, perhaps even swallow up civil institutions such as the university. To make the practice of intellectual discourse dependent on conformity to a predetermined political ideology is to nullify intellect altogether." End of quote. For Said, intellectual discourse is above all, again, a quote, the freedom to be critical. Criticism is intellectual life, and while the academic precinct contains a great deal in it, its spirit is intellectual and critical, and neither reverential nor patriotic. It's the freedom to critique the terms of an, exclusionary, of an exclusionary national identity that is vital both to the university and to the nation. Quote, 
Otherwise, I fear the old iniquities, cruelties, and unthinking attachments that have so disfigured human history will be recycled by the academy, which then loses much of its real intellectual freedom as a result." End of quote. Here, in a somewhat different language, is Kant's idea that critical philosophy provides the ultimate corrective to abuses of state power. Said's notion of national identity was one that disclaimed the triumph of one people over another and the insistence on homogeneity as the bottom line of a common culture. Instead, it is the recognition, enabled by critical thinkers in the humanities and social sciences especially, of its relation to other national identities and within the nation to the multiple identities we inhabit, to the differences that bind us, to a commonality of shared differences rather than to a genetic or historical sameness. Even more important was the lesson that, quote, human life and history are secular, that is actually constructed and reproduced by men and women. This means that there is nothing fixed about our social and political arrangements, that they are open to criticism and to change. It's precisely the specter of change, of course, that threatens the rulers of the authoritarian state. Said argued that the function of academic freedom was to protect and preserve the critical spirit, ensuring the pursuit of justice and truth wherever it might lead. Quote, rather than viewing the search for knowledge in the academy as a search for coercion and control over others, we should regard knowledge as something for which to risk identity. And we should think of academic freedom as an invitation to give up on identity in the hope of understanding and perhaps even assuming more than one. <clears throat> Our model for academic freedom, Said wrote, should be the migrant or traveler, voyaging beyond familiar places, confronting the unknown. For him, academic freedom is a kind of passport <clears throat> for international travel, guaranteeing the right of scholars to go wherever the search for truth may lead. It was one way of addressing the tension at the heart of the mission of the modern university, that between utilitarian nationalism and non-utilitarian inquiry, thanks, between reason of state and reason itself. In the United States, the concept of academic freedom was formulated by a group of professors at the turn of the last century, precisely as a way of mediating that tension, of providing a rationale for an autonomous faculty, not as a peculiar elitist privilege, but as a guarantee of advancing the common good. In 1915, the newly organized American Association of University Professors, among them the American pragmatist John Dewey, articulated a vision of the university that was at once immune to powerful interests. In the United States, these were both state legislators and private benefactors, Caesar and Mammon, and that promised to serve them, however indirectly, by producing new knowledge for the common good. Their version of academic freedom rested on the notion that knowledge and power were separable. The pursuit of truth ought to have nothing to do with public conflicts of interest, even if new knowledge could weigh in on one side or another of those conflicts. The university was defined as, quote, an inviolable refuge from the tyranny of public opinion, an intellectual experiment station where new ideas may germinate and where their fruit, though distasteful to the community as a whole, may be allowed to ripen. As that last reference to distasteful reactions indicates, academic freedom was designed to protect the most critical, the most unorthodox of university faculty. A professor ought to be a contagious center of intellectual enthusiasm, wrote one university pre uh, president. <clears throat> it's better, for, and this is his quote, it's better for students to think about heresies than not to think at all. Better for them to climb new trails and stumble over error than to ride forever in upholstered ease on the overcrowded highway. And of course, these early 20th century formulations are wonderful to read. The best statement I've seen of the principle of academic freedom comes from the regents of the University of Wisconsin in 1894. This was, I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin, and this was a plaque on the wall of the main building at the university that we read all the time. They, the the uh, regents wrote this in 1894, repudiating efforts by the state legislators to fire a professor because his teaching did not conform to their economic views. This is a long quote, but worth listening to. 
As regents of a university with over 100 instructors, supported by nearly two millions of people who hold a vast diversity of views regarding the great, great questions which at present agitate the human mind, we could not for a moment think of recommending the dismissal or even the criticism of a teacher, even if his, some, some of his opinions should in some quarters be regarded as visionary. Such a course would be equivalent to saying that no professor should teach anything which is not accepted by everybody as true. That would cut our curriculum down to a very small proportion. We cannot for a moment believe that knowledge has reached its final goal or that the present condition of society is perfect. We must therefore welcome from our teachers such discussions as shall, su shall suggest the means and prepare the way by which knowledge may be extended, present evils be removed, and others prevented. We feel that we would be unworthy of the position we hold if we did not believe in progress in all departments of knowledge. In all lines of academic investigation, it is of the utmost importance that the investigator should be absolutely free to follow the indications of truth wherever they may lead. And here comes the best line. Whatever may be the limitations which trammel inquiry elsewhere, we believe that the great state University of Wisconsin should ever encourage that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. <coughs> so that's the end of the, the quote. The autonomy of professors defended in this statement rested on the fact that the faculty was a self-regulating body, trained and credentialed according to the rules of their discipline and profession. They were, in the words of the philosopher John Dewey, an organized society of truth seekers uniquely qualified to judge one, another, one another's abilities. These organized societies were the national professional associations that trained and certified competence, a form of expertise we depend on for the advancement of knowledge in all fields. The legal scholar Robert Post put it this way, disciplines are grounded on the, pre on the premise that some ideas are better than others. Disciplinary communities claim the prerogative to discriminate between competent and incompetent work. University administrators, those charged with the efficient running of the institution and its legal and financial operations, and the trustees who govern with ultimate authority, are not in a position to question the expertise of the faculty in matters of research and teaching. Instead, they share governance with the faculty, each carrying responsibility for separate activities, together ensuring the viability of the institution. The guarantee of economic freedom is at the heart of their relationship. I was reminded as I wrote this of an experience I had here at the CEU more than 15 years ago during the tumultuous reign of the rector Yehuda Elkanah. At one meeting that I attended, he confronted faculty and students who were protesting the planned reform or elimination of programs in gender studies and environmental studies. There he justified his right to, de to decide unilaterally with a phrase that was endlessly ridiculed by those who considered him something of a tyrant. A university is not a democracy, he said. In a way, of course, he was right, but not exactly. Typically, a university is not a democracy in the sense that everyone gets to vote about what is taught and how, although one of my colleagues at the Institute told me there are exceptions. In the Cambridge colleges, there is real democracy, he said, in, in the UK. <clears throat> He's a, an advocate, so I'm not entirely sure <laughs> of, of, of what that means. But, but more typically, a university is a hierarchically organized cooperative society, perhaps better to say a federation, of experts with different competencies who share responsibility for its critical social mission. Trustees usually have the final say, and administrators recommend action about faculty and students to them. But a certain division of labor is also the norm. Ideally, each group respects the other's competencies in their processes of decision making. Of course, the dangers of trustee or administrative overreach are sometimes as troubling as interference from politicians and financial patrons, but so are calls from the right, we're hearing a lot of this in the United States these days, for students' right of free speech to determine what is taught and for what some are calling substantive neutrality or balanced interpretations in the classroom. Post's reply to this movement seems right to me, and it's a quote, disciplines do not create expert knowledge through a marketplace of ideas. 
in which content discrimination is prohibited and all ideas are deemed equal. Although there are often conflicts within disciplines about what counts as acceptable work, critical new ideas are not always granted validity, and there have been long struggles by scholars, feminists, post-structuralists, critical race theorists, queer theorists, to achieve legitimacy for their fields of study. Still, it is academic freedom and not student free speech that informs these struggles. If academic freedom is the prerogative of a specialized group of professional intellectuals, and if the university in which they work is not technically a democracy, on what basis can the university claim its rights? Why is it that academic freedom has been the cry of university presidents and faculty facing unprecedented attacks by authoritarian politicians in Turkey, Poland, Hungary, and lately also in the United States. It may be paradoxical to argue that democracy depends on the university, even if the university itself is not a perfect democracy, but that is the case. It's the case because critical thinking, Kant's notion of reason in the face of power, or Dewey's idea that innovation depends on challenging deep-rooted prejudice, or Saeed's insistence that freedom cannot simply be reduced to venerating the unexamined authority of a national identity and its culture. Critical thinking is the lifeblood of democratic societies. Without it, all visions of justice and hope are lost. Critical thinking depends on informed and disciplined knowledge, <clears throat> on our ability to search for and to teach our students how to search for truth. That kind of teaching is not a democratic process. It cannot be one. And yet democracy depends on it. Real democracy, I should add. Illiberal democracy is an oxymoron. When the state finds itself at odds with critical thinking, we know that the search for truth has been shut down. When populist orators decry the elitism of the academic establishment, we know that knowledge production is being directed to nefarious ends. When what Said called the secular dimension of critique, its refusal of transcendent explanations for human life, whether based on history, God, or nature, when that search is replaced by invocations of essentialism, the borders of knowledge are being closed and the search for truth in whatever realm is canceled. The denial of academic freedom to its universities, of permission to pursue truth wherever it leads, signals the ultimate failure of democracy and is, does not bode well for the future prosperity and health of any nation. One of the ironies of the current relationship between universities and nations is that the most endangered institutions are the ones once considered the most democratic, the public universities supported by the state. Those universities which are open to students at minimal tuition costs depend on the state for financial support, but also legally the state has the ultimate authority to determine their future. Indeed, it's often in the name of protecting the public's financial interest that politicians justify their intervention in curricular and faculty domains. It is those public universities which most easily succumb to the demand that, as Saeed put it, intellectual discourse must worship at the altar of national identity. And so they succumb as well to the suppression of critical inquiry that is the inevitable result. The resurgence of strong nationalist tendencies is evident across the world, at least in part as a reaction to the rise of globalization and its undermining of the frontiers of national sovereignty. The reassertion of the importance of the nation is arguably the populist response to a crisis of neoliberal capitalism. This has brought with it the test of patriotism for all manner of intellectual work, a patriotism that is antithetical to free thought and the academic freedom that protects it. In the United States, we have the example of the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, warning university students that, quote, the fight against the education establishment extends to you. The faculty, from adjunct professor to deans, try to tell you what to do, what to say, and more ominously, how to think. For DeVos, the job of educators to teach students how to think is beside the point. Her notion of freedom of thought is the expression of opinion unconstrained by the requirements of truth or rigor. The real problem for her, as for those seeking to consolidate their power at all costs, is that critique will expose the abuses that necessarily accompany authoritarian rule. 
In the modern period, new private universities have grown alongside public ones, often to represent special interests that weren't being served adequately in the public realm. The numbers of new private universities vary widely from country to country, as does their relationship to the state. Usually there's some kind of contractual agreement that recognizes their legitimacy as a degree-granting institution, but they tend to have greater independence than their public counterparts. In the US as elsewhere, many private universities were originally founded by religious groups, but that was not exclusively the case. And even those that were originally religious have become increasingly secular, as is the case with the American universities in Cairo and Beirut, or with, uh, even with Boazici University in Istanbul. Some private universities were established to provide a more elite environment for students of the upper classes or for those with financial means but who were ineligible for admission to public schools. Although private universities typically require state certification, they are less susceptible to direct in intervention than are state-supported institutions whose financial interest gives the state greater power to intervene. That's why the private institutions have been able to preserve something of the critical spirit in the face of an all-out assault on higher education by those seeking to consolidate nationalist identities and to eliminate not just opposition, but also the kind of thinking that would call rulers to account for the violations of principle and justice they undertake. Of course, private universities are subject to pressures from donors and politicians. They are not immune from attempts to rein in critique and to control what is studied nor are they free of the neoliberal processes that are everywhere undermining the substance and ethos of a classic university education. But still, they occupy a privileged place in the realm of academe, and that privilege has made them, in our time, the custodians of academic freedom in the sense I've been talking about it, as the protection of the search for truth wherever it leads, of the spirit of critical inquiry that at its best refuses repression and compromise. If in the United States, the University of Wisconsin is no longer a place that allows for that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone truth can be found, private institutions remain in a better position to protect that legacy. It's on their campuses that it's still possible to teach freely and to resist interference. The call for academic freedom resonates with the values and principles to, way, to which they at least nominally aspire. I think that's the case for the Central U European University here in Hungary. As one of some pri several private institutions of higher education in the nation, it has long been able to stand apart from the currents and patterns of successive political regimes. It has also long been a training ground for the leadership of movements for social justice, the rule of law, and the creation of open societies in the region. On the one hand, one might ask how a small graduate institution could pose a serious threat to a government with vast military and police resources at its disposal. On the other hand, the fact of the attack signals the danger that the quest for truth by critical thinkers is seen to pose to authoritarian rule. The frightening aspect of this is that power is on the side of the state. Indeed, the resolution of the crisis might well come from a ne negotiation between two supposedly sovereign entities, the state of New York and the nation of Hungary. But there's also a hopeful side to the story. It suggests that despite the lamentations of scholars about the end of the university as we knew it, about what Bill Reddings called the university in ruins and Chris Newfield deems the unmaking of the university, there's something that persists against great odds. The process of erosion of the academy has been gradual and thankfully incomplete allowing the legacy of Kant and Humboldt to survive, even as its homogenizing cultural function has disappeared. There are pockets of resistance on campuses which honor the principles and practices of truth-seeking. We can see this in the calls for academic freedom that echo across the globe, in the thousands of protesters who filled the streets of Budapest, and who also to, con to continue to speak out in Russia, Turkey, Poland, and the United States. We can see it in the international outcry against intellectual repression that refuses to accept defeat. And perhaps ironically, we can see it too in the determination of authoritarian rulers to banish critical thought and the institutions that foster it. Their determination is a measure of the aspirational power 
of the idea of academic freedom, but it's only aspirational. To get rulers to value and respect it requires a political struggle, the dimensions of which are extremely large. What is the nature of that political struggle? Does it undermine the pluralism and diversity of views that are the proud values of the search for truth and the production of knowledge? I don't think so. The protection of critical thinking has always involved a confrontation with power. By its very nature, it is political. But the political struggle I'm referring to is not partisan or ideological. Rather, it commits us to the continued practice of critical thinking. The principle that guides us, that articulates the meaning of our struggle, is academic freedom. Critical thinking in this definition of it is both the cause and effect of academic freedom. I leave you then with something of a circular argument. We need academic freedom to protect the necessarily nonpartisan, but nonetheless uh, political work of critical thinking, even as we must engage in that political intellectual work to bring academic freedom to life. But the politics of the moment requires more than critical thinking. It requires rallying support for the only guarantee we have that democracy can be saved or restored. I hope this conference will give us the means to begin to think and act on that requirement, to recognize the importance, to say nothing of the pleasure of our intellectual work, and to find the practical political means to continue to do it. It's the challenge we urgently face, and one we have no choice but to meet. Thank you.